Well, there must be a new spirit moving in the world if an American was invited to France to speak about our shared values, <laughs> especially sandwiched between a Russian, speak, uh, Russian and a Serbian, who I consider brothers. <laughs> My speech is about where, conservative, where conservatism goes after Trump. Uh, in order to start down that path, we must define what conservatism is. Now, there are some debate whether we should even call ourselves conservatives. Some people prefer saying we're the pro-family movement or some other title. Uh, I believe that conservatism is a good description of who we are, and here's why. All the way back in 1954, there was an American author, Russell Kirk, who wrote a book called The Conservative Mind. Uh, this book was on the cover of Time magazine. No one expected that a book by a professor who had written his dissertation at St. Andrews come back to America, and right after Lionel Trilling, the famous social critic, said, liberalism is not only the dominant intellectual tradition in America, it is the only one. Right after that said, two years after, it's a bestseller. The Conservative Mind by Russell Kirk. They tried to trace conservatism in the Anglo-American tradition from Edmund Burke all the way to uh, T.S. Eliot with a lot of Americans in between. When he defined what conservatism was, there were seven main points. I don't have time here to go through all seven, so instead I'll stick to three. Number one, a belief in a transcendent order of good and evil, right and wrong. Religion, faith. In the West, Christianity. Now there are other religions, there are other faiths around the world. They can still believe in a transcendent order. They can still be conservatives. Number two, the centrality of traditional family life to the social and economic order. Well, he's writing this in 1954. Uh, there was not an LGBT lobby in 1954. But still he understood that the family was at the center of any just social order. That we, as human persons, are embedded within families. And he saw, I think, that the next step beyond Marxism would be the cultural Marxism of destroying the family from the inside. And his great fear was that with attempts to destroy the family, as has been said earlier, the state would have to grow so powerful in order to achieve its end, which is what we've now seen. This is 1954. He was a prophet. Number three, and I think this is important. I don't know if it'll translate well. An appreciation of the proliferating variety of traditional life. What did he mean? Well, we are conservatives, but it is a diverse world. We do not seek to make everyone look like us. When I visit uh, Lavon in Georgia, the intactness of the culture, of the tradition, is part of the beauty to come here to Paris. It's unique, it's special, it's different. Vive la de France. <laughs> That's the only time I'll butcher your language. <laughs> I appreciate the beauty of your language too much to try and butcher it anymore. <laughs> uh, but seriously, this root, this understanding that while we have a shared belief in God, in family, in country, that countries will be different, languages will be different, customs will be different, and we do not seek to make everyone look like us. Again, 1954. Since that time, we've seen many who might even call themselves conservatives seek perpetual war for what they claim to be perpetual peace, to try and change countries to attempt to make them all look the same. That is not conservatism. So now we take these broad views. This is my understanding of what conservatism is. We take this broad understanding of conservatism and we apply it to what we've seen with Donald Trump. Well, we've seen some very good things on the first two examples of uh, key beliefs to conservatism. Uh, the first two key parts of the framework on family and a defense of faith. 
In family, he rescinded President Obama's executive order on the transgender issue. We actually had President Obama do an executive order that said, if you want to take federal funds, then you must say and accept that boys who say they're girls can end up being in the girls' restroom. Girls who say they're boys, and more than that, Christian colleges, Catholic colleges, uh, religious institutions were being pushed to say they could not have any federal funding if they didn't accept this new false vision of what it means to be a human person. That was rescinded by Donald Trump. Very good. Also, President Obama changed our policy. Our policy under Bush had been no federal tax dollars to promote abortion around the world. This is, this is so simple. This is so obvious. Why would we take money from Americans who have a fundamental, there's a disagreement in America about abortion. Why would we ever take their money to fund abortion abroad? Trump stood up and changed that policy. Two very good things. But I think it's in the third area, the appreciation of the variety of experience, that we're going to see uh, larger moves and a bigger change that will open up a lot more, uh, a much broader area for us to work around the world. What do I mean? It is no secret that the US State Department and our diplomatic corps under President Obama had made their, if not their, not only a top priority, probably the top priority, spreading an ideology of the redefinition of family around the world. In country after country, especially in developing countries, countries were told, uh, change your understanding of human sexuality, change your perspective on the LGBT agenda, or we will withhold aid. Ambassadors leading attacks on the family in these different countries. This was, as was alluded earlier, Joe Biden was very clear. This was a key part of American foreign policy, that now changing cultures, nations, view of sexuality, of the family, is a key part of spreading quote-unquote human rights among the world. You notice it's an inversion. This is not about human rights. This is about undermining the real rights of these people in all these countries. Now, because um, President Trump, but because President Trump does not see our role in the world in the same way as Obama saw our role, not only because of his perspective on family, but because there's a view that we need to concentrate on America. We shouldn't be going around the world, changing countries, changing cultures, and especially spending our money on it. So I want to make the point that I don't, I'm under no illusion that President Trump's primary motivation is my primary motivation, defending life, defending family. But the fact that America, and I believe this is already happening and it's going to take a while, we need patience because the State Department is very hard to change, but we're already seeing Nikki Haley at the United Nations stand up for a pro-life position. We're already seeing new ambassadors appointed who I don't believe will move in this direction. We're already seeing a much more common sense foreign policy, especially when it comes to, to family issues. Even if that's not the goal, that is the effect. And that allows us a much wider space to work together around the world. Now, uh, again, I don't think that Trump will fundamentally change what conservatism is. It, is. it is something that will go beyond any one man. I don't think that you're going to see the sort of uh, massive change, even in international relations, more of a friendship uh, with Russians and others. It will be very difficult to see these major changes. Some may be disappointed. But what I do see is that a new spirit a new alliance, a new feeling of, if, if I, uh, forgive me for using the term, conservative inter internationalism is emerging. The fact that just personally, uh, many of my friends are sitting here uh, and we have similar stories of large families 
And when we talk, we now speak a common language. 15 years ago, a Russian and an American talking about what's going on politically, I think there would have been a lot more conflict. But it doesn't matter when we're speaking, we're talking about the same things. The attempt to redefine marriage, the attack on the family, the attack on human life. I just returned from our regional World Congress of Families in Lagos, Nigeria. It was in a room a little different than this room, but about the same number of people. All of the faces in the crowd were very different. There were about six uh, of us lighter skinned and the whole place <coughs> filled with Nigerians. What were they talking about? Next to me on one side was the Archbishop of Lagos, Catholic Archbishop. On the other was a tribal chieftain, complete with a crown. And I'm looking around thinking, would this even have been possible 10 years ago? And when they speak, they speak with our voice. They stand up and say, we are so happy you're here. We're so happy that there are Americans that understand that it is wrong to come into our countries and try and change who we are. It is wrong to try and redefine marriage and family. It is wrong and will always be wrong to kill unborn babies. The, the area... The areas of agreement have opened up and become so important. And a new vision has emerged where we would not be talking together, working together, had not George Soros and all the others launched an open attack on something so core, so vital, the very nature of who we are as human persons, the family. And so, specifically, where do we go from here? beyond Trump, beyond any one person. I don't know that I, in fact, I know I don't have the perfect answer. LeVon raised a, a great question. What is it, what will it look like? Well, I know that the world is pregnant with something new. And I know that we are some small part of it. Specifically, joint projects of leaders all around the world, like the World Congress of Families. Our next World Congress will be in Budapest, Hungary, uh, May uh, 26th through the 28th. We're partnering for the first time. The Hungarian government is partnering with us. They call themselves a family-friendly country. They're willing to stand behind it. And we expect two, 3,000 people, maybe more, to all come together from around the world. It's not just a meeting. What happens after these meetings? One of my closest friends, Ignacio Arzawaga, is the head of uh, Citizen Go. You may have heard we have a bus together traveling around uh, northeastern United States. What does the bus say? Well, it's pretty extreme. It's biology. Boys will always be boys, and girls will always be girls. It's emblazoned on the side of the bus. Okay, so we drove the bus first to New York. We parked it in front of the United Nations. I was in a meeting in the United Nations in the Committee on the Status of Women, and I come out, and what has happened? Who are our opponents? They're people that are willing to pull a hammer out of the back of their shirt and bash the windows in of a bus that has a message that they don't agree with. Who is intolerant? Spray painted the entire bus. You could see it on the internet. Then we traveled to Boston. It's one bus. The mayor knew we were arriving, so what does the mayor do? I must have a press conference. I can't believe they're saying boys are boys and girls are girls. <laughs> so he holds a press conference. He not only holds a press conference, he knows our bus is there, so he raises the rainbow flag over our bus. Who do they think we are? Do they think that somehow they're going to stop us? That we're, 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 we're so weak that we'll just run away? No. We stayed there in Boston, they threw paint, rocks, someone got the idea of throwing rotten meat at the bus, I don't know, uh, all of this is on tape. Then we go to Yale, uh, some, a feminist group decided that they were going to get their own uh, truck and put a sign saying that uh, uh, hate speech is not allowed in New Haven, 
It's hate speech to say a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. And so they tried to stop their truck right in front. We had to have a police escort out. But we go on. We've probably earned $3 million in free media coverage to make our argument because of the attacks on the bus. It's just a microcosm of all that we can do together. We have a global statement on marriage, the Cape Town Declaration. You can sign it at capetowndeclaration.com. There are religious leaders, uh, political leaders, members of parliament who have signed it. I am optimistic. I am optimistic. Maybe it's just a part of being an American. I am optimistic. Why? Uh, Eric Kaufman wrote a book, the Re uh, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? The reality is that we are having babies. They are not. And even a liberal, even a liberal who t totally and completely disagrees with everything we believe, he writes a book saying, us liberals are a little too sanguine. Things don't look that good. The only people that are having babies are people that are in tr traditional religious structures. And I see no way to stop it. It's not enough, though. We don't want to wait 80 years, 100 years. We don't want to look in the eyes of our children and not be able to tell them when schools attempted to teach them that their parents were bigots, when schools attempted to tell them that they were not who they are, that God's design is irrelevant, that we just stood idly by and did nothing. I don't know each way in each of your lives exactly what you can do. But I do know that there are many small things that you can do, from signing petitions, to speaking up, to supporting politicians. It's incumbent upon all of us to do this. And more than that, to even look beyond our own country, to work together with folks that we may have disagreed with in the past, to create a new type of conservatism that sees that the family, that faith, and that true freedom are something worth uniting together all around the world and being bold and courageous in the, in the, in the defense of this truth. God bless you.